welcome. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You, I am asking for a motion for approval of the minutes from the meetings held October 24th and November 3rd. So moved. Move. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> uh, persons wishing to address the board, I have Linda Walsh. Linda, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. You have about five minutes to speak, and would you please state your name and your address? Okay. My name is Linda Hallstrom. My address is 3115 East Bragstead Drive. Thank you. Last Friday, the Argus Leader published an article titled, Teachers Face Tough Questions After Election. The article talked about children in Sioux Falls who are feeling afraid. The article said some children have come to school wondering if people hate them, wondering if their families might have to leave America. That was a difficult article for me to read. Difficult for me to realize that children in our community, in my hometown, might be feeling afraid. And it also made me realize what a challenge teachers face in assuring that every student who enters a classroom in Sioux Falls feels accepted and feel safe. Not an easy task when one thinks about all the different backgrounds, beliefs, abilities, and needs that are represented in every classroom of Sioux Falls. Lisa Feldkamp, a teacher at Garfield, who was interviewed for the Argus Leader article said, you really have to make sure that those kids know this is a place where you are accepted unconditionally. So tonight, I just wanted to be here to say thank you to Lisa Feldkamp and to all the employees of the Sioux Falls School District who work to make sure that every student feels appreciated and safe. Thank you, Dr. Maher, to you as well and to the members of the school board for your leadership in creating a safe environment for all students. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I please have a approval of the agenda, please? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good news report. Good evening. In the spirit of constant teaching and learning that goes on in our schools every day, our Good News Report features a staff development opportunity that has been hosted on a number of occasions from, by Sioux Falls New Technology High School. New Tech and its project-based learning platform draw many, many curious educators from around South Dakota and from other states as well to see how this new age learning actually works and is implemented. Dolly Elwine and Heidi Jorgensen are administrative leaders at New Tech. They uh, will be joined up here, and I'll have you ladies come forward, by a very familiar face, Dr. Diana Messick. She's a former New Tech principal and now USD Department of Education faculty. And they're going to explain some of the recent sharing that has gone on uh, with other educators to share information about the New Tech model, the project-based learning in general. Thank you, Deanne. We want to thank you for giving us a few moments of your time this evening to share some good news. Um, this fall, we once again applied to be a demonstration site for the New Tech Network of Schools. And out of 126 high schools in the New Tech Network, we are one of four high schools that were chosen for that great honor. So there is an application process, and they vet us, and they interview us, and um, we feel really proud to be a demonstration site again. What that means is that we host visits uh, when somebody is thinking about joining the New Tech Network. They will bring in visitors to be with us at our site for a day. And um, we host our own visits just from the tri-state area. Um, already this year, we've had six site visits. 
and um, it's been going very well. We've had a lot of interested visitors, and one of those site visits was uh, USD um, have now brought their seed 400 students. They came last week, but also Dr. Messick brought her administrative interns to visit us back in October. And so I'm gonna let her just take a couple of minutes to speak a little bit about why she continues to bring her students up and, and what it, that means for her program. Thank you. I, the first thing I wanna say is thank you for having the vision and the support that it took to create that successful school. It's amazing. <laughs> And uh, every year, we have administrative interns at USD. The program since last year now is a year-long program. And we currently have 63 interns in the program. 12 of those are superintendent interns. Four are special ed directors, two are curriculum directors, and the rest of them are all in the K-12 principal program. So there are a lot of people out there aspiring to be principals. I want to bring them to New Tech because, A, they really want to come. <laughs> but they, um, I want them to see in action what it looks like when you have developed a school that's student-centered, collaborative, high engagement, and project-based learning. So they spend half, a day, half of the day there. And I know this takes a lot of staff time to do that. And actually, students spend a lot of time with them. And they, they, that's who they want to talk to. They want to talk to the students. And they want to go in the classrooms and see what does this all look like when you put it together. So every semester, when I, I say that we're going to have a visit, it's been 12, 16, this time 27. And I offer it both in the fall and the spring so that they can come and that they can bring some people with them. So each time, they're bringing with them more staff members, their superintendent. They're very interested in um, what it looks like, what, how do students become successful in this. And of course, we talk to them about what kind of support it takes. It can't exist without support from the school board and the administrators in, pro in, in developing something like that. So they want to know, how do you start? The other thing that I want to mention is that there are six interns from Sioux Falls in our program. There are two in the high school, one at New Tech, Dora Young, one at the Washington High School, Michelle McIntyre. Two are in the elementary, um, Stephanie Nacito and Derek Masson. And two in the special ed directors, um, internship, Jennifer Olofsson and Nicole, Oster, uh, Nicole Osterman. So it's a broad program, and we hope that they'll host us every single time, because <laughs> we know that that takes a lot of work. And I want to thank you for the support that you provide for something that's that innovative, nationally recognized. We had had interns who actually came here for that one day from Wyoming, Nebraska, <laughs> North Dakota, Iowa, and South Dakota. So that's really awesome. And we appreciate the time that it takes them and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Because of some of the great discussion and dialogue that happens through those site visits that we host, and because we know that there are people thirsty in the district to know more about project-based learning and are working to incorporate into their classrooms, we offer a project-based learning academy every June. And those dates have already been set they're on your infographic, the 12th and 13th for PBL1 and June 14 and 15 for PBL2. And we push that out to every educator in the district and then educators from around our surrounding districts and then all of the schools that come and do site visits at our school. And we have hosted in the last, this will be year seven, that we have hosted it come 2017 and we have hosted over 200 educators through that PBL Academy. So it's a great way to spread the news of the great work that we're doing in this district. So thank you very much for the opportunity that you have given us and empowered us to be able to change the face of education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
gentlemen, do we have any conflicts of interest that need disclosing at this time? Seeing none, may I please have an approval of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, supplement consent agenda A, claims to Sanford. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries with an abstention from board member Ryder. Um, supplement consent agenda B, claims to Avera. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes with an abstention from board member Parker. Now we move right into the reports of the superintendent. Okay, we'll have four board. We'll have four board reports tonight. The first two will come from our director of curriculum instruction, Ann Smith. Good evening. The first report is our Ready Bodies Learning Minds pilot report. In the spring of 2015, occupational therapy and physical therapy OTPT staff participated in an in-service on Ready Bodies Learning Minds presented by the developer of the program, Athena Odin, who is a physical therapist from Texas. The present premise of RBLM is that for a variety of reasons, our students enter school in very different stages of physiological and neurological development. Many come to school less developmentally prepared than expected. Trends over the last 40 years indicate that factors that might influence this lack of preparedness include exposure to technology as recreation, an emphasis on managed time rather than free play time, poverty, family dynamics, and an increase in academic rigor and demands on young children. As a result of the in-service, our district OT and PT staff were encouraged to implement the exercises and activities that they'd learned about in their therapy with students and to assist in incorporating the concepts in classrooms. Our therapists observed a high number of students who still retained reflexes that typically are not seen in kindergarten students. And after implementing the activities, they saw gains made by many of the students. In addition to the physical gains, research shows that students who regularly engage in the reflex activities also show improvements in academic and behavioral skills. Our classroom teachers were also very interested in this. I think it's easier to understand what Ready Bodies Learning Minds is if you see it in action. Ben Smith has prepared a video for us showing us the motor lab at Rosa Parks. Anymore, kids aren't so much um, running and jumping and merry go rounding and rolling down hills. So they aren't always sure how, how to make their body move the way it's supposed to move. So that's what we're trying to replicate here. So the first exercises kind of help them figure out those movements, where they are in space, and integrating some reflexes, some primitive reflexes. And we kind of went out slowly, recruited some teachers, um, people that were interested in doing it with their class, and we kind of started there with just a few classrooms here and there with um, teachers that were able to work that into their uh, daily schedule. And so then the district kind of started looking at it and thought, hey, this could be great for every classroom. So this year we picked four pilot schools to be a little more involved in to get them going on the path and we're hoping to have great results. We did a pretty intensive in-service with all the teachers and all the people that would be involved. So they had a good foundational knowledge of what was expected and what the outcomes could be. So about the beginning of October, they started with the reflex exercises because that's the most important part of the program. So they were expected to do that at least twice a week, um, all four, and then if they can work one or two in in their classrooms in between um, work that they're doing there, that's all the better. So they worked on that for two to three weeks, and then we introduced the stations, which are meant to kind of hit all those sensory systems, some vestibular with the spinning, um, proprioceptive with jumping, there's rolling, um, working on balance, working on eye-hand coordination. So they started that um, about the beginning of November. So they haven't been going long, but you can definitely already see improvements with how kids are moving, how they're able to maintain their posture, and they're, they're just stronger in their motions. The research that Athena did had shown that um, after eight plus months of doing this program, kids improved their scores in reading and math, for sure. 
Um, and so the idea is you're, they're better organized in their body so they can sit in their desk and so that when they look up to the board, their body hasn't moved so that they've lost their place on their paper. Those are the kind of ways it, it crosses over into the classroom. This isn't meant to replace recess. It's not meant to replace PE. You know, recess, they need that free exploration. Uh, but hopefully, they're taking some of the things they've learned here, and now they feel confident enough to do the monkey bars, or to do the swings, or to play ball, because they might not have had that skill before. The classroom teacher is meant to be the leader. We're here to kind of teach and consult and kind of get them started, but then the teacher is in charge of their classroom, and as you can see, they've been doing a great job. The kids really respond to them. They're well organized, and so they're moving through things in an efficient manner, because we don't want to take away from their classwork. So if they can get in and get out in 30 minutes or less, that's the goal, and the teacher is the, is the leader of that. Pretty quickly after they begin, we hear things like, it seems like the energy level of the classroom has come down. Um, you know, sometimes they already see improvements in handwriting and neatness and writing on a line. Um, and a great thing is, is we've always talked about incorporating movement into the classroom. Now they have some great ideas to draw from. So after lunch, you know, when they come in after from recess and they're, they hit that lull about an hour later, they say, let's get down and do popcorn. You know, so it's some easy things they can implement in the classroom too to help that uh, the kids focus all day long. At the end, we want to do some kind of cool down because as you can see, the energy level can get high. We try to alternate a real high energy activity with more of a low, calming, quieter activity, but they do get excited. So what we want to do is pull them back together before they head back to their classroom. So just a few minutes of quiet, deep breathing, um, you know, music, something to get them centered again, then they can quietly line up and get back to business. Two education assistants have been hired to assist classroom teachers in implementing the exercises and setting up the motor labs. The education assistants initially received trainings from the OTPT staff, and they are shadowing the OTPT staff to ensure that they know how to monitor the reflex exercises so that they're done correctly. Those EAs started today, and we're hoping that with their support, it'll be even easier for the classroom teachers to really take control of this because, again, it's not the OTPT staff that are going to be driving this in the regular classroom. It's going to be the classroom staff. <clears throat> I would like to introduce Barb Avery Sterud and Joy Schaefer Powers and Trish Nelson, who are here. Barb is our assisted services supervisor, and Joy and Trish are, and Jolene is here as well. So there are three of our OTPT staff who have been working to do the training and bring this program to our kids. I would ask that the board would acknowledge the progress and implementation of the Ready Minds Learning Mi Ready Bodies Learning Minds pilot program in four of our elementary schools. Any questions, Fran? Well, go ahead, it's your question. <laughs> Sorry, I have a bunch of them. Um, so I noticed that there wasn't a ton of equipment, but there's obviously equipment that's being used. Was that already at the schools, or was there some purchase for the program? The um, and there's what you're seeing in that motor lab. There's a variety of levels of implementation you can do for this. And so the motor lab at Rosa Parks, there was some equipment that needed to be purchased for that, and the Rosa Parks was able to secure the funds to get that, I believe some of it came through some grant funding and things like that, okay. but yeah. I just didn't see it as a cost, yep. so I was curious. Yep. Um, and then just from, I, it's kindergarten, <clears throat> correct? That's what the pilot is. It's the, the, the um, exercises are targeting younger children. Okay. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't have so many classrooms that we couldn't make sure that it was being done with fidelity, so we focused on the kindergarten classrooms. So do we know, um, we'll just say there's 25 kids in a kindergarten class and it, we're talking about reflexes. Do we have any measurement to say it's five out of every 25 in a kindergarten class? Is it 20 out of 25 that still have, re like I'm just curious what the impact level is to the number of students in each class that are still have these reflexes. And that is in the preliminary data that, the, that, that Jolene and Joy and Trish have gathered. Do, I, do you have a rough estimate? Okay, we're, we're, we're gathering that. That's part of the, okay. yep. Okay. But the, but the program itself would be implemented throughout the classroom? Yes, so not really just targeting specific students. It's really all, the program does right. everyone in the classroom. That's correct. Um, and then I'm just curious if we looked at all into, like I think it's great to have EAs. There are PT aids. Have we ever looked at getting like an actual therapist aid to make sure that, that it's somebody that has the 
background and experience in therapy to actually monitor and make sure that the exercises are done with fidelity, I guess, have you, as you said. I'm just curious. I don't know if that's... And, and what, we, what we looked at for the purpose of the pilot was that we would need specially trained EAs. So, the, so we hired our own EAs to give them special training at the end of the pilot if we feel that that was not sufficient then we would look at, at okay. what other type of staff we would need. Okay. And I think it's awesome that there's a um, partnership with USD, because um, I think there's, working in the medical field myself, I feel like there's a lot of great research that could be done. Have we reached out at all to like a local hospital to see if they have a ne peds neurologist or anybody else that might be interested in doing some research as well? At this point, our conversations no? have just been with USD. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further questions, Fran? Hearing none, may I have a motion to acknowledge the progress and implementation of the Ready Bodies Learning Minds pilot program in the four elementary schools. So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Oh, it sounds like a great program and excited to see what uh, results we might see from these schools. I have one more question, sorry. Um, so this is, Okay, well, right now it's kindergarten. Have we looked at all, I know, as we look next year into like summer climb as that being a target audience at all for some of these same interventions? And we actually did do some of the reflex activities with summer climb this last summer. Okay. And what we want to do this next summer is clean that up and have a little better fidelity. That's part of where we learned that we really needed to have a specially trained EA so that we had someone sure. who's mm -hmm. monitoring um, because the classroom teacher, it's really too much to expect that one person can monitor 25 bodies as they do these activities. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was just, as we were listening to the video and it talks specifically about math and reading, it fits so nicely into those goals of summer climb. So any way that we can get those activities be more targeted when yeah. we already have those students we're working with would be fabulous. So yeah. that's cool. Thank you. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Ann. Our next report is also Ann's. I'm just providing you a little filler Thank right you. now, Ann. Cheerful pattern. <laughs> <laughs> there are currently 2,072 English language learners in our in our classrooms. I put together a chart so that you could see how this has trended over the last 10 years. And you'll see from the line that while we've had an increase, it kind of seems to plateau over the last four years. As we move along, you'll see a little bit more that goes into what these numbers mean. But the 2072, that means these are students that currently have not tested proficient on the WIDA test of English language proficiency. If you look at our whole student body, there are an additional 1,361 students who were ELL but have tested proficient. So that 2,072 is just the ones who are still in the program, but there are more who come from an ELL background. When students enroll in the Sioux Falls School District and ind indicate that there's a language other than English that's spoken at home, they first go to our intake center where they are tested to determine their levels of English proficiency. And then they're enrolled through the intake center. These numbers show you how many new students come to the Sioux Falls School District each year, indicating that a language other than, in, than English is spoken. This would not include kindergarten students who just enroll. They're already in a family. So there would be more than this that are new ELL students every year. These are just the ones that are new to the district and do not have other family members in the district. Um, of those ones who are coming through our intake office, 65% would be immigrants, and that includes refugees. Refugees are a subset of in immigrants. Of those immigrants, not necessarily all of them are new to the United States. Many of them have settled somewhere else in the United States and come here to be with family members or whatever. Um, so about 52%, a little over half of our new enrollees, though, are new to the United States, and this is the first school that they've, they've participated in. Looking at our newcomers over the last couple of years, you can see some shifts. We watch this as, 
as the years go on. In 2014-15, there was about 107 of our students who are coming from Mexico, Central America, and 149 from African countries, about 51 from Nepal, Bhutan, India, and then 117 that are from a variety of other countries. Then you see a switch, 2015-16. Uh, about 183 from the African countries, 179 from Mexico, Central America, about 41 from Nepal, Bhutan, India, and then about 35 from other countries. So kind of a, a consolidation where they're coming from. Another way of looking how this shapes our ELL population is to look at the most frequent languages amongst our schools. I gathered the frequency of languages from 2004-5, 2008-9, 2016-17, not because there's anything scientific about those years, it's just that I had the charts from those three years and could put it together for the comparison to show my point, which is that um, in 2004 and 5, 2008 and 9, we did not have any Nepali speakers in the Sioux Falls School District. And by 2016-17, it's our second most frequent language with 240 speakers. <clears throat> the other thing I would point out about this chart is that these are all current ELL students, the language of our current ELL students. There are many more languages, and these numbers would look different if we talk about our ELL families, because there are families where the students who have tested proficient, but the families themselves still need interpreters when they come to parent-teacher conferences, things like that. I also find it a feel like this is something that gives us an opportunity to think about how the world situation has changed over the years. Because again, you look at in 2004, 5, 2008, 9, Bosnian and Ukrainian were two of our most frequent languages. And now those numbers have, have dropped. I mentioned that that 2072, it looks like our numbers of ELL students are tapering off, but our numbers of new students are not necessarily tapering off. It's just that we're having enough students score proficient that that number of students re receiving services has, main, has remained fairly steady. Um, we are seeing an uptick in enrollment at the immersion centers this year. Uh, they've been arriving at a fairly fast clip so that our in immersion center enrollments at all levels are higher than they have been at any other point. When we talk about our ELL services for our students, we have center-based services at the elementary level. So when students leave the elementary immersion center, they transition to a center-based site where there is where there are trained ELL teachers to help provide the classroom teachers with academic support and language support for the students. At the middle school and high school level, we have sheltered classes. So as opposed to talking about a center-based site, we have teachers in different content areas who are prepared to teach the ELL students, provide that additional language support as they teach content in science, math, and what have you. We do have some families who choose to attend a school that is not a center-based site or that does not have those services available, does not have the specially trained ELL staff. Those students still receive instruction. We're working with their classroom teachers. Um, the instructional coach will help provide strategies and things like that, but at those sites, they're not re there is not a specially trained ELL teacher assigned to them. In your report, the written report, you see that broken out by school, and you'll see that there are virtually no schools in our school in our district that do not have at least one or two English language learners in the classrooms. When students are uh, determined to be English language learners, they are determined that by the WIDA Access Proficiency Test. WIDA is, stands for World Class Instructional Design and Assessment. And the WIDA scale that we go by is from one to six, showing the academic, their proficiency in academic English. And it's important with ELL students to understand that there's a difference between conversational language and academic language. WIDA says that by the time a student would score a six on the WIDA test, then they would be speaking at, their oral and written communication in English would be comparable to English proficient peers. 
The state of South Dakota has said that when students achieve a 4.7 on the WIDA scale, they can exit ELL services, that they've, they've achieved a degree of proficiency that's sufficient for them to um, continue without special ELL services. So we're, we work with our students, and our goal is to ensure that they make progress each year. Again, the South Dakota Department of Education has to define what constitutes making acceptable progress. What they have said is that acceptable progress is at least a 0.5 growth in their WIDA score. As students get more and more proficient in the language, it's harder for them to make that much of a gain in a year. So you'll see that the percent of our students making progress, it would be easy to say that 100% of them should make progress. It's not that they're not making progress, it's just that they're not making enough progress to count as proficient. We have had a couple of changes in the program. In 2015, you see our 67% of students making progress makes it look like we had a banner year. Why can't we just capture that and do that every year? Actually, what happened that year was the test that they take has three tiers, A, B, and C. We were operating under the information and instructions that we had received from the Department of Education, and we believed we were doing it correctly to tier most of our students in tier B. In 2014, we learned that the tier B test has a ceiling of a 5.0 on the WIDA proficiency. With that ceiling, if you have students that are getting very close to that 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, for them to show growth if they were beyond a five, it was impossible. We needed to have more of our students tiered into a tier C. So we re-tiered for 2015. We had this bubble of students that, <coughs> that scored proficient and showed greater progress. So our numbers in 2015 look look very different. And then in 2016, we transitioned from the paper pencil WIDA test to the computer-based test. Um, and we no longer have an AMO, from this, an annual measurable objective from the state, because under the changes that are coming down from Every Student Succeeds, they no longer establish a state AMO in the English Language Learners Program in the same way. Each year we do have students who score proficient. Again, you'll see that big bubble in 2015 where 23.44% scored proficient. That backs down to about 15% in 2016. Um, again, there's no state AMO to measure ourselves again, and that 2016 test was the computer-based WIDA. Once our students score proficient, the law requires that we monitor them for two years, monitor their academic progress. And if you think about the fact that we know that we're exiting them before they really truly are proficient, this is an important thing that we need to continue to do. And it's a challenge for our ELL teachers to know exactly and touch up with the 631 students that we currently have that are in those first two years of having exited from the ELL program. We are implementing a software program called Elevation it allows us to set it up so that there is automatically a survey that goes out to all of the classroom teachers. They fill it out to indicate if any of the students are struggle, struggling. If the students are struggling, we get a red flag. And so the ELL teachers know specifically who they need to follow up with and in which subjects. Um, this is the, this fall is the first, we were able to dabble in it a little bit last spring, but this fall is the first full implementation of the Elevation program. That concludes a quick overview of where we currently are at with our ELL review program. And I would ask that the board would acknowledge the review. Any questions for Ann? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion to acknowledge the review of the English Language Learners Program. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ann. Our next report is the Middle School Flesh Report. Dr. Henry, our middle school coordinator, will deliver this report. Hello. This report will provide an update on the Middle School Foreign Language and Elementary School FLES program. The Foreign Language and Elementary School FLES program was developed as part of the programming for Rosa Parks School Global Studies World Language Elementary School. All of the K-5 students at Rosa Parks receive Spanish instruction for 15 minutes each day to develop basic Spanish communication skills. The Rosa Parks students continue the FLES program into middle school at Patrick Henry and Whittier. FLES was impl implemented in the sixth grade in the fall of 2014, seventh grade in the fall of 2015, and eighth grade in the fall of 2016. In the fall of 2014, the middle school FLES students were enrolled in High School Spanish One. High School Spanish One turned out not to be appropriate for all FLES students, and some students in need of instructional inter interventions were not enrolled in Spanish One. Therefore, not all of the Rosa Parks Elementary students were able to participate in FLES. In addition, of the 36 FLES students who were enrolled in Spanish One, only 16 earned the half credit for high school Spanish One. So a plan to ensure the continuation of a successful FLES experience for all students was needed. In May of 2015, you, the school board, approved the recommendation that FLES, the FLES program in middle school be offered instead during the 15 minutes of pro time rather than as a high school Spanish class. This allowed the sixth grade FLES students to continue to learn Spanish in middle school without the intensity or stress of taking a high school course in sixth grade. The middle school FLES students will continue the 15 minutes of Spanish pro in pro time in seventh grade. And then in eighth grade, these students will enroll in high school Spanish one with an opportunity to earn high school credit. The 16 students who did earn credit as sixth graders in 2014 took the second semester of Spanish one in seventh grade and now 13 of those 16 are enrolled in high school Spanish two as eighth graders. So I ask that the board acknowledge this implementation of the six through eight plus program at Whittier and at Patrick Henry Middle School. But I have a comment to add. Generally, this report is given in June prior to implementation. Now that it's November 14th, I have some numbers that I would like to share with you. The current data for the middle school FLES enrollment show that only five students are currently taking Spanish one as eighth graders. So after three years of implementation at the middle school level and a lower than expected participation, it is recommended that a review of the FLES program be considered. I wanted to add that current data. Okay. Any questions? When you say a review of the FLES program, do you mean the FLES program at an elementary level or a FLES program throughout the middle school level or both? I would say to look at the whole program. The whole program. Okay. But I think Dr. Maher gets to lead that. <laughs> well, I would, I would agree with you, Dr. Henry. I, I think we need to look at the outcome and see if it's our desired outcome and then drill back from there without any preconceived notion. But I think the, the data, and thank you providing, for providing the updated data, I think the data begs the question of, is this giving us our, the bang for the buck that we want? I don't know that answer, but I, okay. I agree with you. I think we should review it. Any other questions? I would ask that we acknowledge the complete implementation of the K through eight FLES program at Whittier and Patrick Henry Middle School and also review it. So move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thanks, Sandy. The last report from uh, the superintendent tonight will come from Todd Veek our in our finance office. Mr. Veek. Thank you. Uh, at our last regular board meeting, we had our first quarterly budget report for FY17. In uh, about a month, at our first regular meeting in September, we'll 
wrap up the FY16 budget process by having our audit presented to us. And tonight we start the FY18 budget process. So what you have before you are the guidelines and timelines that are recommended. The guidelines look very familiar. We are once again proposing four packets uh, for each, uh, for most of, the co most of the cost centers where you go down to 90% and then you work your way up back to 100% is level four. And if you wanna do expansions, you can. You just have to request that, that we add those out for you. One thing that's new, and it was based on what we did last year, which was a great idea by board member Morrison, was with the federal budget packets, is have at least two. So you're comparing, you know, you're, you're, you've got a finite amount of dollars and you're saying, do you wanna do this or do you wanna do that? Which do you wanna recommend? It was a great discussion. I was on that committee that worked on that. So this year we're asking that within the different subsets of programs that the committees are meeting on, that they, they wanna do an expansion, they offer a, a potential cut to match that. And then they say, here's the potential cut and we recommend, we still recommend this or we only recommend it if there's money available to you. So that, that'll be new for the process this year and actually I think it'll be great um, based on what happened in the federal committee last year. So those are the guidelines that are recommended. And uh, then just to kind of highlight some of the timelines, of course we're starting tonight um, on, the, on December 6th, actually I believe it's the 7th. We are meeting with the directors and coordinators to distribute the budgets with all the rules and whatnot. Um, budgets are due, so they work on them for a couple of months. Budgets are due on the 24th of February. On the 16th after session ends, the K through 12 budget review committee will meet to go through the uh, programs that are recommended. For the board, our first work session will be on April 5th with the public hearing on the 10th of April and then uh, tentative adoption of the budget would happen that night. And then uh, of course, in the first regular meeting in, in July, which would be the 10th this year, we will bring to the board the budget to adopt and certify the levy so we can send those to the auditors. So with that, I would uh, recommend that uh, the board approve the budget guidelines, timelines, and the FY18 budget process as presented. Any questions for Todd? Hearing none, I have a motion to approve the budget guidelines. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Todd. Now we have uh, some policy, Kate. Yep. Um, we have two policies up for second reading. Um, policy ECAB and its accompanying regulation is being updated to clarify practices that are currently in place and to improve access control to enhance facility security. And policy IKF and its accompanying regulation is updated to clarify the district's credit acceptance procedures for all types of credits. Um, can you do anything? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the changes ensure that the district has established procedures to comply with a new state law that be uh, became effective on July 1, dictating the terms for accepting credits received outside the school term. Both of these policies were um, posted for public review and no comments were received. So I move to approve the second reading of policies and their accompanying regulations, ECAB and IKF. We have a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And next we have um, review, revise of five policies. BJBA purchasing, quantity purchasing. DK and its accompanying regulation, payment procedures. DKC and its accompanying regulation, expense authorization and reimbursement. EBCE and its accompanying regulation, school closings and cancellations. And ECA and its accompanying regulation, video surveillance. Um, there were minimal revisions to the policies, so second readings are not um, necessary. So I move to approve the review rev revision of said policies. We have a motion, may I have a second? Second. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Uh, those policies are will carry. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. We are adjourned.